Today is the speaker Tobias Seckholm from the University of Uppsala and Metagle Flair Institute, Sweden. And his title is on the screen, Holomorphic Curves and Not Conormals. And Lina will send uh, his slides in the chat. Okay, we'll go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, I, I'm gonna give a sort of survey talk uh, about what happened uh, over the over many years actually. Let's see if I can go down. Yeah. So contents are the following. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to start with the description of this Uguri Wafa large end duality. And, uh, and then I'm going to describe uh, a, pr a proof of that. Uh, um, how how to define that and first it, it's sort of it's almost immediate from definition of a possible definition of open gromov witten invariance and then uh this leads to um you know connection within homfly polynomial of knots and uh, holomorphic curves and then uh, these holomorphic curves are very much like in gromov witten theory they come in very infinite collections and and I'm going to talk about two ways of collecting things into smaller pieces and so somehow to show that these counts are typically not as infinite as they first seem so so this this is in line with uh, maybe Donaldson Thomas invariants and and uh, and other things but I would say that this approach of trying to capture Gromovitin invariants from infinity, where, where the data is much smaller, is 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 now been going on for a couple of years. But I, I think that's a very important perspective, and uh, I, I hope there will be many more things to come. And I should say, as it's stated there, that what I'm talking about is um, results from series of of joint works with uh, Aganagik, Wafa, uh, Lenin, and uh, Piotr Kosharski and Piotr Longi and Vivek Shende. And uh, many, many of the things that I'm saying in the beginning are somewhere on the archive. Um, I can give you references later on perhaps and some towards the end is more uh, less well established and not, not yet on the archive. Okay, so let's start from this Uguri Wafa uh, large end duality. So, so the, the geometry is the following. We, we start with a knot, just a simple closed curve in the three sphere. And uh, associated to such a, a curve is its uh, Lagrangian conormal in the cotangent bundle of S3. So those are all the co-vectors along the knot, which annihilates the tangent vector. So topologically, the knot is an S1, and then the vectors along it, which are perpendicular to the knot, is, is an R2. So this is an S1 times R2. OK. and. Uh, we are going to, in order to state this Uguri Rafa conjecture, uh, we are going to move this Lagrangian into another space, which is the resolved conifold. So if I first explain what resolved conifold is, um, so one can view the cotangent bundle of S3 as, as a quadric in uh, C4. In, a, in other words, if you look at the equation there, the sum of squares, is equal to small real epsilon, then it's not hard to see that this is the cotangent bundle of S3. Uh, so if we shrink the epsilon and shrink the S3, we go to kind of cone, which is the singular thing, and we can resolve it in another way. So we can resolve it by blowing up the singularity. So we get the P1 times P1 in the middle, and then we blow down one P1 and get what's called the small resolution, and it's called the resolved conifold. And as a space, as an analytic space, this is uh, O minus one twice over CP1. But at infinity, these two spaces are very much related. So topologically, for example, both looks like S, S2 times S3. And with a kind of topological I, the difference between them is that in one of the spaces, you fill in all the S2s and you get S3 times R, R, R3. In the other space, you fill in the S3 and you get S2 times R4. Okay, um, so how to shift the cone normal of the zero section? Well, one can do it by taking a small closed 
one form. So basically, a neighborhood of the knot is S1 times D2. And in this neighborhood, we take the form uh, D theta, uh, D theta along the S1, and we shift along that. So that's a closed form. We get the Lagrangian, which is not exact, but it doesn't intersect the S3 anymore. And since it is outside of the, you know, uh, the midpoint in this cone, we can think of it as a Lagrangian in the, in the resolved conifold. So that, that's where we place ourselves. And then uh, I need to say something about the two objects that this Gurugaf uh, large and duality relates. So on the one hand, it's the, it's the colored, symmetrically colored Homfley polynomial, as it's called. So it, it's something that you can define, it's defined in knot theory, and in particular, we will see in a while the definition of home flip, standard home flip polynomial without, with standard coloring, um, but, <clears throat> uh, and, and, and so the, also the other one is, of course, rigorously defined, but maybe here I will, I will use the uh, Witten's definition because that's how one could guess this Uguru Rafa large and uh, large and duality, and it's, there it's uh, expressed as an expectation value of the trace uh, of a connection, of the holonomy of a connection uh, against the churn simons path integral. So uh, the churn simons action is, in, is uh, viewed as an oscillatory integral and you integrate, supposed to integrate over gauge orbits. So this is some sort of famous 1989 paper of Witten. He showed that you can compute this thing by what's called a skein relation. So we'll come to that and we'll use that as the definition of Homfree polynomial. But this is one of the sides and there, there is a collection, one for each integer, uh, where you take the trace in the nth symmetric uh, representation. Okay, so the other uh, thing that we are going to relate to uh, is, um, is the, um, the open Gromer Witten partition function. So this is a is a function which intuitively count holomorphic curves with boundary on uh, the not conormal viewed as a Lagrangian in the resolved conifold. So the resolved conifold, of course, is is actually Calabi-Yau manifold, and the Lagrangian has mass of zero, uh, mass of index zero. So therefore, all Holomorphic curves formed with boundary on this LK, and there is they are of formal dimension zero. So in all, principle, all, all, all genera, yeah, all genera, yeah, that's right. So it's it, it's the dimension formula is independent of genera in this case. So so we are going to try to count them, and uh, it's it's a sort of long-standing problem how to count open curves. Uh, but let's for the time being pretend that we can do it or define it as some kind of uh, string theory, um, topological string partition function. So that would be like a physics definition, but I will actually explain how, how you can actually count them rigorously in a bit. But for now, um, how we count them is we, we count them as follows. So we have such a map. It's a map of a Riemann surface with a boundary. And uh, it's, the, it, the map is rigid, but maybe it's it's not going to be counted like an integer because there may be automorphism and, and so on. So you have to use some multi-valued perturbation. And so there will be a rational number, which is sort of the number associated with this curve. That's the weight W of U. And then we also weight the sum by the string coupling constant to minus the Euler characteristic of the curve. And then we have two variables which record the relative homology class of the curve in X modulo LK. So, so this first integer M there, that's a kind of, that's the close, uh, you know, that, that's the, the close thing sits inside the relative. So that's kind of canonical, but the other one is depends on a choice of splitting, right? The X is not completely canonical. You can shift it by powers of A, this E to X. But anyway, this is how we count them. And uh, with these two things introduced, we can now, oops state the, the Ugorivafa large N conjecture. So 
So then it says that these two functions uh, are actually the same. So if you count on the left-hand side, all the holomorphic curves ending on this Lagrangian S1 times R2, then what you get is the sum of colored Homfli polynomials where uh, in the colored Homfli polynomial, it's, a, it's two variable polynomial, uh, variables A and Q, you set this Q is equal to E to the string coupling over two, and then you take the generating series where E to NX is the nth colored Homfli. Okay, so, so they, they have some kind of physical argument for this, um, which I'm not gonna go into detail about, but I think it's still um, important to borrow some kind of in, intuition from physics to, to explain how you can come up with such a kind of conjecture, because it's it somehow, it's a pretty striking conjecture, right? It, it's, a, it's connecting holomorphic curves and gauge theories. So, <clears throat> so if we think first about some analog, which is much simpler and of course well known. So, so in, in quantum electrodynamics, we, we consider a very uh, standard system there. So that, that's the first line in the figure um, where the red line, which is, is kind of maybe too small, but, but if I'm on the left of this, this figure, there's a red line and that's a proton. And near this proton is an electron moving. And the first uh, diagram there is, is you see the kind of uh, interaction where the, they exchange one photon. So this is the, the simplest Feynman diagram for this process. And then there is another one, which is uh, also famous. The next one is called the Bremsstrahlung or something like that. So, so when you accelerate your electron, it, it radiates a little bit. And then there's the next diagram, which also has a name. Um, and the last one is called, I guess, vacuum polarization. And the other one is some vertex splitting. So anyway, uh, the QED tells us we have to sum up all these Feynman diagrams and we get an amplitude for the process. On the other hand, we can be smart about it. And this is of course kind of famous calculation that in principle, we can just replace these, all these diagrams and say that the electron is just propagating in some potential. And, and what happens with all the diagrams is somehow that they give you um, correction to the naive potential. So first is somehow this one over R thing, which is the column potential, and that's coming from the first diagram. And then there are various correction corresponding to other diagrams, but all in all, you can somehow equally well describe this as the, as the electron propagating in a potential where which starts out the way you think and then somehow corrections. And now this, this uh, we've asked for conjecture comes from some kind of similar reasoning. So the, the starting point is some insight by Witten that if you do gauge theory on a three dimensional <coughs> Lagrangian, um, then it's the same thing or three dimensional manifold is the same thing as doing open string theory on the Lagrangian uh, inside its cotangent bundle. More precisely, if you do U and gauge theory, you're supposed to do the string theory of N brains on this zero section in, in the cotangent bundle. So um, the, the reasoning behind that is somehow that all the string states that contribute to say topological string, at least they're constant. And the gauge fields are basically functions. It's, it's like a, it's the field theory on the space of constants that, that should be modeled. But anyway, if you think like that, so if you want to similarly calculate the, uh, you can actually see this arrow, right? So if you want to calculate some amplitude of propagating from here to here, then you have to calculate the amplitude over all possible surfaces stretching from, from here to here. So you could go maybe straight and uh, you can scatter towards the, the, this Lagrangian, the D brain as it's called, or you can scatter in some more complicated way or even more complicated way. And you have to sum up over all ways of scattering. And the idea here is that as in the first case, you can replace all this scattering by instead a closed string propagating in some background. So now this time the, the, the 
it won't quite be a potential, but it, it will be some other geometric background which arises by turning on a flux across this Lagrangian. And so um, what, what will happen is that you start in T star S3 and you will end up in the resolved coniform. So just like you start with kind of no potential, lots of diagrams, get the potential, you start in, in near this cotangent bundle and you change the geometry of T star S3 into some other geometry. And we will actually explain the uh, mechanism for this. Okay, so um, in order to, to define this thing and to prove the conjecture, we are going to introduce uh, a new way of counting open holomorphic curves. And we will count them in what's called the skein module, which is an object in knot theory. And this is actually exactly, uh, you know, how, how to define the Holmfli polynomial, if you wish. So I, I will first define this quickly. So <clears throat> imagine that you have a three manifold, it's our L, and then the framed skein module of L is, is the module generated by isotopic classes of all frame links in this uh, manifold L, uh, modulo a couple of relations. So the first relation is uh, supposed to be depicting locally what happens. So, so you have a link, a uh, piece of a link, over here, uh, you can see my pointer, right? So it, it's, I, it makes some sense if I'm doing this. Um, hopefully, okay. Yeah. So, so, you, you, so we have one link here. So outside the little ball, this link uh, is something. And these other three links are exactly the same outside. But inside, we have three behaviors. And so what we're saying is that in the skein module, this overcrossing minus the undercrossing is equal to variable C times, uh -huh, I should, yeah, it doesn't matter, but uh, times variable C times the split crossing, okay? And so that's one, one relation. And the other relation is what happens with the framing. So we think of these diagrams as being framed by the blackboard framing. So you, you have a little normal vector in, in the positive direction along these curves. And so here, here we say that the price of erasing a kink or changing the framing is multiplication by A or A inverse if the kink goes the other way. And finally, we have a normalization condition which says that if you have a planar circle in, in a small coordinate chart, right? So it's really a circle framed like as if it were lying on a plane, then that, that has the value A minus A inverse over C, or if you want over Q minus Q inverse, which is also a very normal way of, of writing this. So, so then these become some kind of module and in the, in, in the three sphere, it's kind of easy to see that if you have any knot or link and you're allowed to use these moves, you can reduce it to a bunch of unknots and therefore you reduce it to a polynomial, right? Uh, and so um, that polynomial, so that means that the skein, frame skein module of, of S3 is simply the ground ring. And if you start with a link and you do this procedure, then the polynomial that you get is the Homfli polynomial of a link. So that's the definition. And it's pretty easy to check that indeed, this is invariant under isotopies of the link. And then we were also discussing the colored Homfli polynomial and that can be expressed uh, as the standard Homfli polynomial, not of the knot itself, but of a certain collection of parallels of the knot. So you, you draw the knot and in a small neighborhood, you, you draw certain parallels. You take the, all the Homfli polynomials of those and sum them up. And that's, that's the color Homfli polynomial. Okay, so S3 is a simple business. If you go to some other manifold, which in this talk was relevant, so the S1 times R2, so the conormal itself then, the skein module is, is no longer just at all uh, that easy to generate. So it's, it's, um, it's actually free commutative algebra and it's generated by certain curves. So you, you can pick and choose them a little bit uh, whatever way you want, but basically it's a curve that goes M times around for any integer M and they are connected. So, so somehow that's a set of generators and this is some basis 
with the derive called derive basis, which is somehow basically one you, you take one strand over all the other ones and you go around like a full permutation. So, so this is a pretty big thing. Um, but basically, it means concretely if you have a if you have any link in there, then by these Homfly moves, you can get to a collection of these basic links times the polynomial. So, so the basic the the counterpart of the Homfly polynomial in S one times R two is rather some kind of um, several infinitely many actually <laughs> Homfly polynomials, which are the coordinates in these bases, right? That that's determined okay. by. Um, yeah. Is the scheme module always uh, a ring? No, it's not. But in S one times R two, you can uh, you can make it by taking. Uh, I mean, it's always a ring. You you can multiply by taking some disjoint union or something like that. Um, I, I I wouldn't say always, but but here in S one times R two, what you do is you you stack them outside of each other, right? So for, for the annulus, there is some kind of standard procedure, or if you have surface times R or something like that, then you can sort of stack them on top of each other. Uh, okay, thank you. We won't use the ring structure very much, actually, um, except for like uh, disjoint union, which we sometimes use. Okay, so um, we are going to define a count of holomorphic curves in pretty general setup, and and of course the outcome is also pretty general and, and it's not, not so easy to say what it is um, in general manifolds, but, but it certainly is useful. So, so we start with the kalau biao manifolds. So in our case, this will be either T star, it's a kind of symplectic kalau biao, so either T star S3 or, or the resolved conifold. And then we take a Maslow zero Lagrangian in there. And, uh, and, and in order to define our open gromov witten invariant, we are going to count what we call bare holomorphic curves. So I'll explain in a second what they are. But right now, things just holomorphic curves. So we count all such disconnected curves. So that means that um, the perturbation scheme that we have, it doesn't, if you take you know, the moduli space of one disk, the moduli space of two disks, they're kind of completely different on the face of it. So you cannot take two copies of one disk. You have to move to the new moduli space. Okay, and a bare curve will contribute as follows. So first there is this weight again, so that's some rational number. And then there is the variable C, or if you remember it's Q minus Q inverse, to the negative Euler characteristic of the curve itself. So that's kind of as before, except this, this C is some, some kind of exponential rather than GS itself. Uh, then there is a linking number between the Lagrangian and the curve. And I have to be explain how that's defined. So, um, and that, that's the power, it's uh, the, uh, sorry, it's the A variable in the home fleet, which is raised to this power. And finally, we read off, we read off the boundary of the curve in the skein module of L, right? So, and we sum up over all moduli spaces of disconnected curves. So um, let me maybe say two things. Uh, so I, I will, in a second, maybe I'll start by explaining this uh, linking, and then I'll, I'll describe what is a bare holomorphic curve, uh, which, which is sort of the technical underpinnings of this, which, which I'll, I'll talk about, in, not at all almost in the talk, but I want to at least mention what is the definition. Okay. so. So to define this linking, what we do is we take a, we take a Morse function on the Lagrangian, and then we want to define a four chain uh, in the space which has boundary twice the Lagrangian. In general, it's assumption such thing exists, but in our example, we will use this for mainly for T star S3, and our Lagrangian will be S3 itself. So here, the four chain uh, that we using is not a closed four chain, but it's what they call, um, I guess, borel moore chain or something. So basically you should just think about, take a vector field or maybe a gradient vector field and just take all the rays of this vector field going in positive direction and negative direction 
uh, with the opposite orientation. So that when you take the boundary, you get twice, twice the Lagrangian. And we will require that this, uh, that this uh, chain ends according to the, to, to the vector field along the boundary. So it, it somehow agrees with, this vec with the vector field uh, times j. So, so somehow you have an almost complex charge, you multiply out and then, then you shift it off like that. So it, it will be clear in, the, in a bit why, why we would like this. Okay, but, but anyway, when we have such, a, such data, then for a generic holomorphic curve, it is nowhere tangent to this gradient. So that means that the tangent vector of the boundary and the, and the gradient gives a framing of the curve and we think of the normal to that plane at every point as a normal vector of the curve. Okay, so we're gonna use this normal vector, uh, actually J times it, to shift the boundary of the curve off of the Lagrangian. And when we do that, remember that the four chain is starting in direction J times gradient of F. So if we shift in this perpendicular direction, they won't intersect near the boundary. And we can define an intersection number between U, so there's these orange dots here, and C, the four chain. And that, that intersection number is this linking that goes up here. Okay, and finally, what about the bare, bare condition? So the bare condition is the following. So in, if you take a holomorphic curve in Calabiao 3, then basically that holomorphic curve automatically comes with a lot of holomorphic curves, broken holomorphic curves along it. Namely, you can take a constant curve of any topology and attach at any point of this, this curve. And so formally, it's somehow never really rigid <laughs> in the way because you, you can attach all these curves. But what we are going to do here is we are not going to perturb the constants. And what it means is that somehow we will just leave all the, all the curves of symplectic area below a certain number uh, unperturbed. And we won't care about them. We will, we will prove that somehow it's just in this factor, the C to the power of Euler characteristic, it sort of carries all the information of these constant high, higher genus curves that you get by attaching. So a bare curve, simply means a, hol a holomorphic curve without any symplectic area components, okay? So, so one has to prove, and, and we have proved, uh, construct some kind of perturbation schemes for such, and I, I will come to the key point of that perturbation scheme in a little bit. And as for the weight W of U, you get it from what? Uh, so I, I would get, I mean, so when I, create this perturbation scheme, it basically has to be a multi-valued perturbation scheme, right? Because there are automorphisms of the curves and so on. So it's a, it's a zero of a multi-section. So that there are, there are rational weights on, on them. So it's like some orbifoldness that you have to take care of, right? So, so that, that has very little yeah, to do with these concepts. I'm a bit confused. I understand it's sort of a perturbative. What about uh, your L is non-compact here? Yeah? My L is compact, but the, the curves are somehow confined to a compact region in the right. examples. Okay. They're, they're kind of, they, they don't travel to infinity at this stage at all. Uh, so it, it's as if it was compact. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. so, so the thing is inductive in, inductive in energy and inductive in genus, uh, as usual. But I just leave the symplectic area zero pieces unperturbed. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So the claim is that this curve count is actually invariant under deformation. So I I pick some perturbation so that I can count this thing. It's some oriented zero manifold or orbifold. I count them, and now I deform and I have to check that that uh, the count is remaining invariant. So there are couple of reasons for this. So the first one is about this bareness and constant curves. And, and what you need to prove is that the same thing that happens in 
somehow ordinary holomorphic geometry happens also for perturbed curves. That is that if you bubble off a constant curve, so if, if you're in, in, in a three-manifold, three you're a holomorphic curve, and you bubble off some constant, then actually the curve from where it bubbles off develops a singularity of the differential. So, so you, you see that by stretching or looking very close to this, this point. And if there was nothing happening to the curve, then the piece attached to it by some kind of, you know, how many, by basically riemann hurwitz formula, it goes just once around. So it's a rational bubble. And that's what you can, that's what you can kind of, there's no bubbling in Gromov compactness. So if, if there is a bubble, there will be a singularity of the differential or a double point, something like that. And when you have real boundary, the, the constants can bubble off uh, at the boundary only in co-dimension two. So, so this can be avoided in, in generic one parameter families. Uh, so now with that, we need to care, care about kind of other nodal curves that appear and they can appear in two ways. So here, the first way we see a boundary kind of hyperbolic node. So that this, uh, it's um, uh, from one, on one side, we have the boundary curve, which just crosses through itself, right? So this is uh, a perfectly straight moduli space here. It just happens that at one boundary point, the, the boundary crosses through itself. But at that point, you can glue the two branches of the curve into a curve like this. It basically is like x, y is equal epsilon, where epsilon is zero, and then epsilon becomes non-zero here. And, and so we see that in order to have an, a well-defined invariant, you know, the curve with this boundary has to be equal to the sum of the curves of these, those boundaries. But moreover, the Euler characteristic of the curves in this moduli space is one above one larger than the Euler characteristic in this model because you basically added the one handle here, right? So let's uh, look back at the skein relation. So we're saying that this one minus that one should be equal to the Euler characteristic parameter times that one. And that's exactly what we need in order for, for the count to be invariant at such a point, right? So in some sense, Looking at holomorphic curves, we now derive the skein relation. Let's look at the second uh, disaster. So here we see a holomorphic curve that crosses through the Lagrangian. So it's kind of elliptic version of this hyperbolic thing. And when it crosses through the Lagrangian, it comes out on the other side. But also here, there is a, there is a new component of moduli space born. So this is looking like x squared plus y squared is equal to f. Let's see what's happening. So here we have a positive intersection with the four chain. When we cross through the Lagrangian, we have because of this two L a negative intersection with the four chain. And Euler characteristic is jumping. So what we're saying is that this one times A minus that one times A inverse should be equal to the circle times Z. But if we again go back, you see that this is just computation of the Homfli polynomial of the unknot. Okay? So Z times the unknot should be the difference between these four chain intersections. So we see that these two things are exactly what's needed for things to stay invariant in the scheme. And finally, we have this framing, framing problem that at isolated points, our curve could become tangent to the gradient of F, which we use to define the framing. So if I go back to the pictures again, oops, wrong direction. The, here you see that the tangency moment would be like a cusp-like picture here, right? Where, where we pull the kink all the way. But at that point, the curve is, is of course smooth still, and its boundary is tangent to the gradient of F. But that means that the tangent space of the complex curve that we're actually looking at is tangent to gradient of f times j times gradient of f, which is tangent to the four chain. So as you, as you progress, you create an intersection 
with the four chain. I mean, it's just half of the curve, so you get exactly one, and you check the sign, sign coincides. So, in fact, this imposes further restrictions on our perturbation scheme. So, we would like the holomorphic curves to not be perturbed near the boundary. And that, that's also not hard to arrange because we need this to be a complex tangent space. Um, I mean, JJ complex. So, okay, so, so in some sense, except for this first thing, which is a more technical business, two and three is somehow, if we, did, if we never knew any knot theory and we only knew holomorphic curves, they would actually allow us to define the, the frame scan module. And, and, and what we are learning is that the count in the frame scan module is invariant under deformation. And that's, in fact, enough to prove this Uguri Vafa conjecture. So, so how do we prove it? We, we do the following. We take our, we take our uh, so I'm now on the right hand side here. We take the co-normal. We shift it off just a little bit from S3. And uh, in a neighborhood of the knot, the manifold can be taken to be just S1 times you know, R3 with, with sitting in S1 times a small interval times C2. And so it's very easy to see that all holomorphic curves that can form and stretches between LK and the, and the zero section are just the covers of this basic cylinder which, which comes from shifting. Okay, so, so let's, let's, let's do the curves that go once around because it's simpler. So I'll discuss many times around in a second. So for the curves that go once around, we have one cylinder. It has Euler characteristic zero and the boundary of it is the knot. So now we take its value in the skein. On the side of LK, we have like a standard curve. It's one of the generators of the skein, we keep it. On the side of, of S3, we, we have the knot K in the skein of S3, okay? Now we are going to perform what's called SFT stretching. So as in the lower part of the picture, we, we take some even smaller epsilon, uh, that cuts this cylinder that cuts the annulus in in half or something like that and and then we stretch there so we make the, the complex structure very long and when we do that the curve has to go into converge to a building holomorphic building where the pieces are joined at rabe cords rabe orbits but for s3 all the rabe orbits have uh, it's called Conley Zender index two. So it's the geodesic index of a geodesic. And therefore, if the curve has any part inside, it would have to be, uh, it would, the outside would have dimension at most minus two. So generically, it doesn't happen. So therefore, when we stretch, the curve leaves completely. No boundary is still on S3. Everything is stretched, falling outside. And so what we're left with is a curve count where A counts, you know, the linking with S3, which is homology class. This curve is fixed here on LK. And, and the, the C variable is the genus parameter. And we're saying that the count is remaining invariant. So the Homfley polynomial of K is equal to this count of curves. And so we're now counting in a very stretched structure in T star S3, but um, it's not so hard to see that for a very small CP1 in the resolved conifold, that those curves that we count, they're still holomorphic. We can set it up so they're still holomorphic, still transfers, so the counts are the same. I mean, actually, the curves are the same. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting kind of short of time, so let me just very briefly say what happens with the many times around curves. So what you need to do is you need to do this calculation, and we will do it for the unknot in some way, and then you will know that what the other curves are, are exactly the, the colored home free. So you somehow, by looking at the unknot, you can understand which link here appears when you perturb the cylinder. And that link is exactly the link that you have to insert along K and take the home free to get the colored home free. So the proof is somehow exactly the same. Uh, okay, do you so color so just by symmetric power of? That, that's right. So uh, symmetric colors means that it's somehow here in perturbation theory, it means that I just take all the curves that go K times around and I sum them up, right? 
if I would want all colorings, I need a more refined count where I see, you know, the partitions, how, how many yeah. times they go around. So basically, this argument plus a more careful study of the Hofflink would give you all colors in a similar way. Yeah, okay. But, uh, okay, for now we do symmetric colors. Okay, um, very good. So now I want to tell you a story about how one can actually approach these curve counts in a, I mean, it's nice because the home flea is nice, uh, but the home flea is somehow lumping together all genus at once. And sometimes you want other information or more packaged information. After all, the colored home flea is a very long series, right? So, so we'll, we'll try to find some uh, properties of these curves by probing them from infinity. And the key point here is that at infinity, our manifold looks like the intersection of the Lagrangian co-normal in the unit cotangent bundle of T star S3. So it's a, it's a Lagrangian torus sitting there. And that has punctured curves on it that are pretty easy, actually, or comparatively easy to find by some Morse theory. And they interact with the curves inside and allows us to actually compute a lot of the gromer witten theory in a very, in a very um, let's say, condensed form. So we, we will start by considering only disks. And in this, the sort of intuitive count, which is hard to make sense out in this game world, is that the count of all curves should come from the exponentiation of the count of connected curves where then the disks are the first, the first term. And, and we are looking at this disk potential first. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna give a short description of what this not contact homology is. So it's the shikhanov Ilyashberg algebra of, of the Lechandrian co-normal. So this is some algebra generated by rave chords, and it's generated over the homology, the relative homology of the Lechandrian inside the unit cotangent bundle. So kind of more or less in the same way as before, it's a little bit non-canonical, this splitting. We have the basis of H1 of the torus itself, is the longitude of the meridian. And then we have the class of the fiber, which is this A, then times rave core. So rave cores are graded, and they're graded here for the co-normal. They're basically, um, they are basically, binormal geodesics and they're graded by Morse index. So they're coming with grading zero, one, and two. And the differential is like in some floor homology counting uh, holomorphic curves, which has one positive rave chord and several negatives. So let me look at the picture. So they look like this. So here at positive infinity, we have a rave chord. Then the curve stretches down on the Lagrangian, Lagrangian times R. And it goes down to several negative rape, rape cores. And we define the differential to be the sum of such things where this is one dimension. There's some kind of translation invariance in this symplectization region. And then, uh, much like in homology, one checks that the differential squares to zero. That's because the boundary of this two-dimensional moduli space consists of broken curves. And in particular, I mean, the reason for having an algebra rather than just the usual floor homology is that I I even if you glue two strips, you know, they can split into a more complicated object where you split off some little disk like this, right? So, so this becomes a DG algebra rather than a chain. Okay. Now, uh, the, this theory has uh, the virtue of being actually computable. So you can compute it from uh, brain presentation of your knot or link. And uh, it has a couple of generators. You see the numbers there and so on. And let's, let's do, let's add, carry with us a couple of examples. So for the unknot, uh, the binormal chords form a circle. So after perturbation, there are two of them. One has uh, two chords, one has grading one, one has grading two. And uh, the grading two, one somehow, zero in uh, differential. And the differential of the grading one is consists 
uh, has contribution from four disks. So it's basically the way you can shrink this core this way, where you can shrink the core that way. And when it shrinks, you have two, two closing up to choose. So you get four different homotopy classes, and then you have to check how many times it intersects or, you know, the difference of all these four, how much it is in closed uh, in relative homology. But anyway, so, so th this is a sum of four disks and there are no negative functions because there are no degree zero things. So you just have a simple polynomial in the ground ring. Okay. For the trefoil, just for an example, we have much more uh, chords. So we have two degree zero chords and uh, these are degree one, B and C, I, J, and then degree two as well. And the important part for us in the differential is the differential on the degree uh, one chord, chords, and it looks as follows. So it's somehow computed by knowledge of the unknot plus some Morse flow trees. But, but in the end, you get the kind of formula from the brain. So it, this is just an example. You see that it's some kind of, whatever it is, six equations in a number of unknowns. Okay, so uh, the, the key to curve counts is what's called the augmentations or the augmentation variety. And to see what it is, we think of this algebra as a family of algebras over the coefficients. And then uh, we look for chain maps or representations of this algebra into complex numbers. So it has to be a unital map, so it cannot be completely trivial. And in particular, this means basically that epsilon has to be zero on the image of the differential, right? So, uh, and, and we call the locus where this happens, the augmentation variety. So if we go back, so this is of course boring for the unknot, this is the equation for the augmentation variety, the expression here. For the trefoil, you see we have equations in two unknowns, a12 and a21, and we are looking for values of the coefficients where all of these expressions are zero. So it's a problem in elimination theory of finding that variety, right? And, um, and here it is. So for the trefoil, we get some other polynomial. In fact, for any knot, uh, I guess it's conjecture, but for any knot, it's, it, there is, this is the co-dimension one variety. And so, so you have a, polynomial, which we call the augmentation polynomial. Okay, so as you see, it's some kind of, whatever it is, it's some polynomial that comes out and it's obviously a polynomial, right? It's, it's something you get by algebraic manipulation at infinity. And now we are going to relate it to counts of holomorphic disks. So the first observation is that if you have an exact Lagrangian, so that's a Lagrangian for which this contact form admits a primitive, on, along which they can form no closed holomorphic curves, then that defines for you an augmentation. By counting holomorphic curves, which just has one positive puncture at degree zero chord, and then nothing. So here we check that the composition of epsilon and the differential on degree one chord is zero because it just describes the boundary of a two dimensional actually moduli space, which is reduced one dimension to divide by our action. And so because of that, the chain map equation holds and on coefficients, the map is just the induced map on homology. So that means that this E to P, P is zero or E to P is one and E to X is one, belong to the augmentation variety for this A is equal one for any node. And in fact, for the unknot, it's just equal to that, right? If, if we set A is equal to zero in this polynomial we have, we get this factorizing. And in fact, it's the only polynomial, the only knot for which this is true. So um, one can show by various things. So I can also show that somehow in this A is equal one, the A polynomial divides the augmentation polynomial. Okay, but that's not where we're going. We're going to see what happens when the Lagrangian is not exact. So our Lagrangian, the co-normal, when we put it into the resolved conifold is certainly not exact. And in fact, there are many holomorphic curves forming on it and we are now looking at the disks. So then this attempt at counting all the 
sear, all the sear dimensional curves stretching down like this one is no longer a chain map because we have no splitting. So the curve can move down and split off a rigid disk. Well, this is a problem that somehow has been studied for a long time, and then there is this bounding co-chain or bounding chain uh, strategy for solving it. So what we do is we take all the rigid disks, and for each one of them, we take a chain which connects it to a standard curve out at infinity, so to, to a longitude. And now we know that if we not just count curves, but count generalized curves, namely the curves which on the boundary, you know, you insert these chains, then this problem goes away because here you see, here's a curve, it's about to split, it splits. And then we continue it with an insertion of this bounding chain. And so what happens is that we remove it and the only breaking that we see is this form of breaking. So that means that it breaks as it should in the augmentation, but the price we have to pay is we cannot just count the disks. We have to count the disks with all insertions of the chain. But at infinity, this is a simple matter because all the chains looks like the longitude. And so to see how many times, you know, how, how, how many things you can insert, well, formally it's just to, to substitute P, that is the meridian variable, by the derivative of the disk potential with respect to X. <clears throat> and then E to the P counts all possible insertions. So, so that means that this equation parameterizes the augmentation, a branch of the augmentation variety. So, so in other words, the augmentation variety, augmentation polynomial can be used to compute the a priori pretty complicated disk potential. So here, here is, here's the calculation for the unknot. So remember that the augmentation polynomial for the unknot was this simple polynomial here. And now we're supposed to solve for e to the p in terms of e to the x. And this is easy in this case, it just looks like that. And we take the logarithm and integrate once to get the polynomial. And the expression is this. And for those who kind of friends with toric geometry, we can draw the co-normal as this toric brain. And indeed there are two disks, one here and one here. And they are the disks, their multiple covers uh, correspond to give exactly these two terms. And uh, you're this CK, the whole generating function, which includes not only WK, but some corrections. Yeah. Uh, is it killed by the quantized? Exactly. So that, that's, that's exactly where I'm going. So, oh, so okay. let, me, let me continue. So, so one can now generalize these to higher genus curves. And, and one can use the, one can use the, gain count here, actually reduce it a little bit. So if you do the U1 skein, that means you substitute Q is equal to A, then you can map from the skein module to the homology of the curves times Q to the basically linking or self-linking. And in that case, you have this relation between curves P and X, right? So if you first go uh, e to x and then go e to p, it sort of crosses it once, right, in, in, in the skein of the torus. So if you switch them, there is a q here, and, and so you get the Weyl algebra basically out there. And then uh, I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm going to be fast. And then you can somehow generalize what we did before. So basically, we look at the one dimensional moduli space of all these connected curves with some, some. Uh, towards at infinity and the boundary of that will be broken curves and curves inside, right? So by invariance in the skein, such curve configurations has to be zero. And that simply means that the curves inside, they're just a psi, right? And now the curves outside, if I remove all the ends up and down, they will give me the quantized augmentation polynomial. So indeed, the full genus story of what I just said is, uh, as, as Jan was saying, is the quantization uh, of the quantum A polynomial. And so 
in the case of the colored home flea, we see that this quantum A polynomial is what's called the recursion relation for the, for the colored home flea. So this gives, in some sense, it's a reason for this thing to ex exist. And in fact, you can even, for simple notes, and hopefully someday in general, compute it. So um, in particular for the unknot, it's trivial. So <laughs> it's just the same thing. So there are no, there are not only disks there, no other curves. And so it's the old polynomial, but now these X and P's are operators. And you can use this to just explicitly calculate whatever all the holomorphic curves are, right? To just resolve the recursion relation. And in particular, if, if you say that, if we go back and we just want to see what happens over these little disks, that's the topological vertex. And if we make the A here very small, so that means corresponds to making extremely long, so we can, it's huge area. This is E to minus area. So area is huge, then we can neglect this term, and we just have this simple recursion relation, X and P. And if we solve it, we get the count of all curves, which looks like that, where Q is E to GS, and that's what's called the topological vertex. So you can indirectly, in this way, uh, prove pretty efficiently what the curve count is, right? And one can approach this also by, um, what's it called? Uh, obstruction, obstruction bundles and so on, and uh, of course, answers agree. Okay, um, so I, I want to somehow say that, it did, of course, forget about whatever I wrote here, but I want to say that it's possible to derive such formulas because at infinity, you can make sure that there are no actual higher genus curves. You just have disks with certain linking and so on. So that's where the Qs come from and positive ends, but it's in principle computable. It's very, it's very uh, time consuming, but it can hopefully be made uh, pretty concrete. Uh, so we did it for the trefoil in a paper with Lenny and we haven't yet kind of a, completely general way of doing it, but it's certainly, if you give, give, give me any example, I could in principle do it. So we can get this thing, it corresponds to the differential. Now to get from there to the recursion relation is still sort of tricky because now you have to eliminate operators and variables. So it's, it's a kind of, we have to do elimination theory in Weyl algebra and that, that's not altogether easy, but the elimination theory already done at the classical level the, for the algebra is somehow guiding the way. So it cannot be very different. So it's like a correction of that. So, so anyway, for, for the trefoil, we were able to do it and it matches with, with kind of known result um, for the home flea. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's the only thing I want to say with this. <laughs> Forget about details here. Okay, so I, I want to end by saying, by giving a sort of, now it has to be lightning fast, story about some other reason for this finiteness. So what we found was we have a pretty complicated count of curves governed by the Humphrey. Looking from infinity, we see that there is some finiteness in this. There is a really kind of quantized A polynomial gives recursion. So I want to, so I want to give the other view of why this is finite. And this is a, here there, there is a very strong assumptions and I, I have some ideas how to prove that such a thing is always true, but, but let me anyway give the picture. So the idea here is that the, all the, if we assume that all the curves lies in a finite set of holomorphic disks attached to the Lagrangian, then we can get a, a quiver expression and somehow express the partition function as a quiver partition function. And the geometric idea is that you know, if you have a Lagrangian, then a neighborhood of this Lagrangian looks like, like the cotangent bundle. And you can now attach disk, basic disks so the, the, to L and you get the kind of a new cotangent bundle which is deformed by these disks. And uh, so for the unknot brain that we saw for the toric brain, it has two such disks. Um, and now one can count curves by using the formula for the vertex, so the, the unknot thing we, we, we did, and then see how they link. So the only thing we need to keep track of is how they link. So here is, here's the expression. So you see that you can now express, if you assume that there are M such finitely many disks, you take the function, which was the function for the 
for the one brain with the disc attached. And then uh, you plug in a little bit non-commutative variable. So you, you take the variable x1, which should evaluate the homology class of the disc that you have. And then it needs to be corrected by dual variables of the other disks. Basically where this one measures the linking between the two disks. And then you should normal order the product. So you need to move all the operators to the right. So what it becomes is some kind of formula like this. And this, uh, this is called Q-Pocamer symbol. It's just a way to keep track of this denominator, one minus Q minus Q squared and so on that we had in, in the Psi function. So it's, it's, a, it's a product like this and a sum over all such ways of combining these things by linking. So in particular, we see that these quiver variables have some geometric interpretation, two variables, just a homology class. And this variable here is the number of four chain intersections. Um, and the CIJ is some kind of linking and self-linking. So uh, I, I, I'm stealing four more minutes of your time. I, I, yeah, yeah, go, you can go, go over the time. Those, okay, okay, yeah, um, I, I go a little bit over. So, so maybe we can try to clear up things in questions later. But okay, so, so here is somehow, uh, now this is supposed, this, if you think about it as a curve count, then it's clear from this definition of generalized curves through U1 skein that this should be the partition function. So we just take all the covers and see how they link and, and the count becomes this. So here are a couple of examples. So the unknot uh, is this very simple quiver. There are two of them, uh, the two disks we saw. One disk, they don't link and one, one disk self links. So this one can actually see from infinity by pushing down this augmentation polynomial, there was somehow this one minus e to p or something like that. So one can somehow recover this if we if we do the augmentation disks in the skein somehow. So that's a kind of very that gives a lot of hope to try to get the linking between the disks, or especially the self link, which is extremely important, as I'll try to indicate later. So here's the trefoil. Trefoil is more complicated. It has six disks on it. And then there is a lot of, um, so they, they're in various homology class. Everybody goes once around, but they have various numbers of A charges. And then there's some linking. So this is a little bit of cheating. So for simple notes, um, <laughs> the, it's always the case that these uh, basic disks uh, are in one one correspondence with monomials in the Homfli polynomial. So that, that's but should you have kind of a two edges because it's equivalent is symmetric or what? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I should say so. So the the single edge is is actually a double edge. It goes back yeah. and forth. Uh -huh. so I'm sort of using symmetry here. So so when I write, for example, this edge here with the two, it really means two arrows this way and two arrows back. So, so everything should be double in that way. It's just like link, linking numbers are symmetric in this way, right? So, uh, thank you. Okay, so these are some examples. So, as it turns out, the the quiver, the partition function, does not determine the quiver. So, in other words, different quivers can have the same partition function, and there are two main sources for this. So, one is one is that there can be a Canceling pair of nodes. So, in fact, the ca the canceling pair of nodes is exactly like the pair of nodes in the unknot, except that the a powers are the same. So, for the unknot, there was an a squared here and nothing here. But if you erase the a squared, those two would be canceling, and the, so that just means that the product of the two functions, right? So, if I go back. The psi of one, so they don't link. So psi of one times psi of the other one, with whatever these cijs are, is actually is one. So, so it's it's some kind of calculation, but they they can be canceling pairs. And there is another source for this thing, which is what we call the multi-cover skein. So um, here's a picture of what's going on. So here we actually have three boundaries, boundaries of three disks, and now. 
we can have, um, I don't know what this is <laughs> doing actually. One, one of them, I think this is crossing a little bit too much, I'm sorry, but, but anyway, so they can cross. And when they cross, they join to give us a new disk, right? And, and the other disks remain. So we can go from two disks with certain linking information to three disks with new linking information. And the linking information is simple to figure out because the new disk is basically the union at the crossing of the other two. So it inherits linking properties from the former disks. If it's a part of a bigger quiver, and things links to these, you, you just have to carry them along to here in, in an obvious way. And then uh, it's a kind of a, an interesting fact that the quiver partition functions do not change. So what it means is that when you do this scanning, you can sort of join the two basic disks and all their multiple covers and count them. You know, it, it sort of means that the scan holds not just for this disk, but it holds for all the multiples as well. And this is a very particular feature of having a disk. If you try the same thing with some other genus, higher genus curve, and you, you do this crossing and you glue and you try to match whatever would be the partition function, it doesn't work. So you need to first express all the curves and sort of differences of disks. Then you can cross through and you, you have some kind of multi-cover scan. So only for basic holomorphic disks that this hold. For other things like annuli, it's not true. So finally, in order to recognize such pieces in a quiver, it's important to understand what happens under framing change. And under framing change, it's somehow, it's a simple formula. So you should imagine your disks living on a solid torus. And when you change the framing, you need to change this bounding chain by hanging down extra disks to change the homology class at infinity. And it gives some rise to some kind of quadratic transformation of the linking. But that means that, for example, if you change the framing here by one unit, you would see a loop here, connecting thing here, and two loops here. And that would, of course, still be canceling because you know, that doesn't operate very interestingly on the wave function one. So, um, but anyway, so when we started this, the, some people found this knot theory stuff and quivers, and they were surprised that some, the quiver, there were several quivers for the same knot, but all quivers that were found can be related by these moves, and I, I believe that this is all there is. I, I want to finish by uh, going to, in a direction where these, these quivers actually become unique. So, um, and that, that's, that's what's called the refined partition, quiver partition function. And so um, what one can do is, you, this is the quiver partition function, and we add in a sort of almost stupid way one more variable to that thing, so we get um, <clears throat> something more refined. And it, it, it has also interpretation as a kind of, um, in, in terms of quiver representation writing and so on, but, but let, let me keep it simple now. So the only difference uh, is that the variables of the quiver is now as before, but we, we separate out the self-linking part and, and we take minus t to that power in the quiver nodes. So geometrically, let's think about what this CII is. So for starters, we had some, Lagrangian, maybe S1 times R2, and we attach a disk to it, right? And if you think about the geometry behind this, there is an integer ways worth of doing that, right? So the symplectic normal bundle of this disk is somehow, you know, you trivialize it, you get the trivialization on the boundary, and you can see how that compares to trivialization of the S1 times R2. When you attach one disk, it's kind of stupid, but if you attach two disks, you can compare the two framings. So this is what this CII is. So it's very much related to how you attach the disk, right? And now, um, and, and, and okay, so geometrically, if you want to find it by studying, if you have an actual holomorphic disk, you have to study the linearized operator um, in some way. But it's determined by holomorphic data. That's what this says. 
anyway, um, if we add this variable, then it turns out that this refined quiver partition function actually knows the quiver. So two, two, I mean, these moves are destroyed. And in fact, you can prove that if you have a quiver partition function refined, then it knows the quiver. And there is another interesting operation that relates this to Humphrey homology. And what you, and this is kind of experimental fact, but I hope I, I <laughs> can prove something about it. But what it is is the following. You, you take your refined quiver, and then you take the uh, things that go k times around, e to kx, whatever the coefficient is. And then you pretend that that comes from a quiver of level one, everybody goes once around, of nodes that do not talk to each other at all. There is no linking whatsoever. So you can prove that there is such a quiver that gives, that it's not hard, that gives this partition function. And those quiver nodes uh, also now come with, with, uh, with powers of A and Q and so on and T, and, and they become, with this A, Q, and T kind of natural way, the generator of the colored Humphrey homology of the knot. And now, so, so basically it's like you, you get some harmonic, I mean, it's not, you, sometimes when you get homology, you have to do some calculation. Here is no differential. It's like you get just harmonic forms at once. You get homology. But there are differentials from the Humphrey homology to SLN homology. So for the quiver, quiver nodes in this business, it means that we have to substitute A is equal to Q to power N. So we do that substitution. And of course, now some previously different nodes could become the same kind of, right? Because one was maybe A times uh, E to X and the other one was, uh, I don't know, Q to N to E times X. And when I substitute, they become the same. So now in order to get the SLN Humphrey homology, uh, SLN homology, I guess just, you should look, you should define some differential on the Humphrey homology. And what it looks like is the following. You substitute and then you, you hunt down canceling pairs and you cancel them in one direction, say from odd to even. And what remains looks like the SLN homology. So this of course is a kind of fairly conjectural picture, but it makes some sense from the physics point of view. So the, what one needs is some kind of S1 action. And hopefully you need it just near the boundary to, to, to say it's somehow this CII is about distinguishing far away four chain intersection to, to near four chain intersection. And, and that's, um, so in some sense, we understand geometrically what all the in ingredients are. Uh, in finding this refinement, but we don't understand at all why it is invariant. So um, I, I am way over time, so I'll stop at this. So please, please ask questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, this is, you, you have this additional uh, variable T, and so uh, where is the place of the super polynomial, which depends uh, exactly? So, yeah, so, so um, super polynomial, should be now the uh, in in an, so so this variable t is somehow is kind of like a in a way, and so the super polynomial should be the analog of the augmentation polynomial for these refined disks, right? Mm -hmm. So it should exist in a, a, a super polynomial a, which also depends on t, and there should also be a quantum super polynomial a hat. Which also depends on which it. kills this psi k. It's exactly, yeah, exactly, to, okay. exactly the same. Exactly the same. Uh, okay. So uh, questions. So thank you very much for your talk. And now the question questions. Mm, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah. So uh, either people cannot unmute. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have <laughs> questions. So, which are, are, okay. I, I, yeah, no, 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 that's fine. I, I have also a question. So I somehow all, all, always confused uh, because uh, when people uh, speak about um, this open Gromov Witten and mm -hmm. simultaneously about open, well, physicists open BPS, mathematicians yeah. open 
uh, DT invariants, yeah. which uh, for physicists, it's a sort of a purely formal procedure. Right. Uh, now, since, I mean, I, I kind of saw several times when you kind of choose something rigid. Yeah. And this certainly uh, resembles, you know, this uh, single particle BPS states, they're kind of rigid and they generate everything in the way similar you wrote with these basic disks. Yes. So okay. the basic disk should, should be these basic BPS generators. So uh, this is some kind of confusion sometimes between BPS generators and BPS states. So, but, but, but anyway, they should be the, they should be the, the BPS generators. So they, they're the M2 brains, basically, ending on this uh, M5 brain. And uh, uh, but you, you speak about open Gromov-Witten and this Yeah, is... so open Gromov-Witten is what happens when you start perturbing these basic disks, right? So each basic disk is sitting there and, and, and the, the BPS uh, generator generates all the multiple covers of that one, right? And all yeah. combinations, kind of two yeah, of yeah, them. Yeah, it's yeah, also yeah. The, yeah. Uh, all right. Which may, so I, I, I'm still somehow confused because you do not uh, mm, somehow, I mean, gromov witten theory is different from Donaldson Thomas theory yes. just by, by definition. All right, when you described your count, it looked on one side as a gromov witten because you impose this bounding chain, blah, 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 yeah. this story. But uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, this object, they, and you can, yeah, you just confirmed they should correspond to some BPS. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the basic disk definitely is more like DT invariants, right? Uh, all right, but there is no kind of corresponding theory of open DT invariants. No, that's right. So in some sense, that's what we are finding here, right? So, so the point is we, we, we don't really know what's supposed to be the boundary boundary condition for an open DT, right? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, that's what... That's but, but, what but somehow here, I think in some sense we are, we are sort of seeing almost what it should be. So it's some, some kind of packaged skein. So somehow, um, I don't know really how to think about it in terms of this, but, but if you think about this basic disk sitting, right? Mm -hmm. What does it come with? It comes with a count, you know, a lot of holomorphic curves that can be counted, that multiple covers, constant attached and so on. And it comes with a certain specific, you know, if you take a five times around curve, it gives some link that goes around the basic, some kind of five times parallel. And we know that link in the skein. So that somehow basically is the the boundary condition of this DT. Yeah, so there might be, I don't know, uh, for, for the resolved conifold, you can speak about uh, closed BPS invariants, which are right. uh, 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 well, well defined. And this means that you can take something closed and attach to your open yes. and get a kind of uh, module structure. Uh, that's, because kind of you, right. Yes, yeah. and I'm just wondering whether, I mean, and similarly, you can pretend that what you called uh, this degenerate, degenerate curves, it's also some kind of attachment, but in the language of gromov witten So I'm just curious whether this uh, mm, uh, uh, BPS open BPS, or how do you call them? This maybe mm -hmm. basic disks. Basic disks, well, yeah. yeah. Whether they generate some module oh. over uh, the um, oh, algebra. You can, uh, 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 yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, th there is there is one more thing that one should remember, and that that's in principle, if you have a closed, if you have a sphere, right? Yeah, it, it can intersect this four chain of the Lagrangian and come down and open up. 
And so, so you can sort of go from closed to open. In gromov witten theory, it should be counted like that. But in some sense, also the closed basic spheres or BPS states mm. should contribute to this um, open thing as well. And maybe that's a good source for learning what you want to learn. I don't know. You see, I am confused also with the kind of naive thing. So when you speak about gromov witten on, yes. on, the, on the resolved conifold side, you should choose some uh, almost complex structure, which is not the one which naturally comes on this complex manifold, some auxiliary. Uh, Mm. But when you speak about Donaldson Thomas, you should use exactly. Yeah, you should use the standard. No, I agree, but 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 you know, um, yeah, it's not exactly the same as Donaldson Thomas, and I don't understand the sort of Shifi story very well. Um, but the complex structure, so it, so okay, I think that for a general knot, the actual quiver picture will appear only in a very degenerate situation. So basically, if you think of the co-normal of a knot, mm. you, you can take the, the knot and braid it around the unknot. And as the, as the knot goes through the, to the unknot, it somehow convert, co-normal converges to a multiple of the unknot co-normal. And I currently think that this true quiver picture is probably only true when it sits right on top of the, of the unknot mm. co-normal. And you, you have various combinations of the basic disks of the unknot conormal combining into these basic disks. So it's probably very hard to make sense out of it in a less symmetric situation. So it's... it's um, uh, uh, and, and, and by the way, when you mentioned that it's an assumption that there are finitely many basic disks, is it an assumption or for a knot it's a result? For now, I think... It, um, No, I, I think it's, uh, I, I, I haven't proved it. I, I think maybe one could figure out the proof along those lines that you can probably find a position where there are only finitely many uh, in some in degenerating towards the unknot, right? Hmm. But I, I think after, after you perturb, it's probably not going to be fine. I mean, I, it, it's, yeah, at least I don't see how to make it finite if you start wiggling things around from, from very symmetric. So, so it's not quite a, yeah. Uh, uh, and also for un un unrefined, so that's about the last part of your talk. Yeah. For unrefined story, you have some strange equivalences between quivers. Is it oh. something which people in quivers did not know? I mean, I. So I don't know very much about Kivers. Yeah, I mean, you can ask. I think, you have. To I think, yeah, I, I think in some sense the. So you have this uh, whatever they call Pentagon relation or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, but that's what kind of yeah. That's I I, I wanted to ask you something. Is there yeah, any I, I cl think, cluster variety for which? Yeah. This yeah. I think it's more or less. I don't know if that generates all that. We, we can certainly derive that relation from what we have. But I don't know if it's enough, if that is sufficient to get all this, I'm, I'm not sure. I think this canceling pair, there was some, somewhere there was some sort of serious, <laughs> wanted to look seriously at these cupo cameras. And at least we didn't, we didn't find reference like that. But, yeah, and, 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 and also just uh, for the last, re returning to this relation to undefined uh, mm, mm, uh, BPS, uh, uh, open BPS yeah. invariants. I remember that very, very long ago, I, 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 I told to Jake Solomon that it would be nice if this Kane relations uh, mm, uh, were really the wall crossing formulas. Yeah. So uh, uh, in your case, when you spoke about this in terms of gromov witten theory, it's yeah. really the, uh, the wall crossing in terms Absolutely. of the moduli yeah. spaces, but it's it, a gromov it's witten exactly, It's exactly that. And yes. the point is, I, I think the main point there is that you need to, 
work in a setting where you do not perturb the area zero curves, right? If you start yeah. doing that, then this is not quite true anymore, right? Yeah, but it certainly resembled me some kind of BPS. I Absolutely, mean, don't yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so, so one can say like this. So if you, th if you think about the BPS formula, right? Yeah. Or whatever. Group in, in, formula, yeah, 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 yeah. You have a sphere. And then uh, you can write up a long series of whatever it contributes. First, you have a contribution at degree uh, one, right? Yeah, and then multi-covers. Multi yeah. Then degree two and so on. And bare curves is like making some perturbation and stopping at the first step. So it's sort of the first step of the Gopa Alpha formula. And then for if you have a multiple cover, you need to perturb mm -hmm. it out to make it a simple curve. But the constant attached behave like the first step in, in the in the in the Gopa Alpha. So it's it's like a sort of a small step towards the full formula, which which should be what holds for these basic disks, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 so bare curve is somehow the first term in the group of group of <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. I remember that the full, uh, mm, the full Gapakumar Wafa, but uh, for, or, or maybe uh, I would say Aguri Wafa for, no, not, yeah, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, it's exactly uh, the uh, Donaldson Thomas series for one three dimensional object. That's yeah, right. so, so yeah, yeah, it's very, very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think okay. I, I think with all this somehow the topological vertex and all this business, that one of the problems is that there was somehow no definition of open global Witten invariance, right? And somehow, well, in this special case, I think yeah, yeah, when, when, when you have when you have S one symmetry, yeah, yeah, you yeah, yeah, define yeah. it, but but there was sort of no no definition outside the symmetric. Yeah, yes. The, yeah. The, that was somehow, and, and this is a little bit better in that way. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly a progress. You do not require this involution. That's I mean, right, yeah. nothing like that. Yeah, so that's great. Uh, uh, more, more questions? Okay, so there are no questions probably uh, so uh, thank you very much for for very nice and stimulating talk thank you thank you